uh, special music for today. Special treat, CK is going to have special music for us at this time. I'm on the yellow mic. Audio's not on. Nothing on the TV right now. You got it on one, we're not the, okay. Well, let's start it over again because you can see it on that one. I don't have to see it. Remote doesn't work. No, you don't have to use the remote. Just hit play. You don't have to use the remote. I just said it there. It's going to be all right, ain't it? Plug the HDMI cable. No. And that's okay. I don't have to see it, but if they can see it, that's fine. There should be a video to go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Isn't that back? All right, well, don't worry about that. Nah, I don't need to see it. <laughs> but we need to go all the way back. <laughs> it's going to be okay. It's fine. You just hit play on the, the machine. Yeah. So eject it and then put it back. Okay. Right, please. Right. 
Day star shine down on me. Let your love shine through me in the night. Lord, I see a world that's dying. It's wounded by the master of deceit. And groping in the darkness, wounded by the master of defeat. But then I see you standing near me, Lord, shining with the light in your eyes. Those loving eyes. I pray, Jesus, shine down on me and let your love shine in the night. Lead me, Lord, I'll follow anywhere you open up the door. Let your word speak to me and show me what I've never seen before. Lord, I want to be your witness. You can take what's wrong and make it right. Lord, make it right. Day star shine down on me. Let your love shine through me in the night. Day star shine down on me. Day star shine down on me. Jesus shine down on me. Let your love shine in the night. Let your love shine through me in the night. Thank you, Cleta. Okay. <laughs> hey, Brandon, you're awesome, man. You really are. Okay, if you would, please, now it's time for our scripture. We're going to ask that you turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. We're going to be reading from verses 6 through 10. Exodus chapter 3. Reading verses 6 through 10. I'll give you just a minute to get there. And thanks again, Cleta, for that special music. What a blessing that is. Okay, beginning with verse 6 in Exodus chapter 3. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. And have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Amorite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. 
Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. May the Lord bless us as we read his word. Harold, we're looking forward to your sermon on vision. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Um, and, I, and I can say this without a doubt, this is going to be a, a fairly short sermon. We're going to be out of here early because I don't know how long I'm going to be able to stand up here. So <laughs> I will say I am getting stronger. What was that? Pardon? No, I'm fine. No, I'm fine. We'll see how long I make it. I'm good at standing on one leg. <laughs> My physical therapist... Uh, was giving me a hard time last week. She was making me walk without my cane. And so we're walking down the hall and she's like, get your head up. I'm like, okay. <laughs> she's like a taskmaster. And she was wanting me to like stand on one leg. And I'm like, I don't think I can do that. And she's like, yeah, you can. I'm like, no, I'm afraid my legs are going to bend the other way. And she started laughing. She's like, it's not going to do that. I'm like, well, in my head it is. So <laughs> it's, it's, your, your brain plays tricks on you about what you think your leg's going to do. It really, yeah. So anyway, I, I understand. I understand. I understand so much people that have anxiety now about walking on uneven surfaces. Like before, that would never cross my mind to walk across the gravel. And now I'm like, that looks a little uneven. I don't know about this. <laughs> I'm not doing a cross country trek here. This is kind of crazy. Let's get that parking lot paved. <laughs> I know, praise the Lord. I'm like, this is, I don't know about this. Um, so anyway, my, my sermon today is on vision uh, and how we see the world. How do you see the world right now? Um, when you get up in your morning, is your day filled with dread? Are you just like get out of bed in the morning like, oh, I've got to do this again. This is horrible. And you look at, you're like, <laughs> why don't I have to get up so early? Well, it's still dark outside, right? Now with the time change, it's still dark outside. Like, I don't like this. And it's cold. Ugh. I had to wear long johns this week, right? I've already put on long johns. It's, it's still November. Um, and you have to go to work, you know, you're like, oh, I've got to deal with my boss. I've got to deal with my coworkers. This is just not going to be a good day. Um, then you go like, oh, it's lunchtime. I don't even get enough time to eat lunch. I've got to woof it down, right? You know, you've been at the hospital, right? You just shovel it down and run back to work. Um, then it's time to go home and you get into traffic and people don't know how to drive. You're like, come on, go. <laughs> um, then you have to fix dinner, right? You get home, you fix dinner, you eat, then you gotta wash dishes, and then you're like, oh, then you have laundry to do, right? Oh, and then the kids got homework, you gotta help the kids with homework, and sometimes that involves some crying too, you know? <laughs> Frustration, then, you're, then you gotta yell at them to get in the shower, to get a bath so they can get ready for bed. You finally get them to bed, then you gotta get yourself ready for bed. And you finally, you collapse into bed and you think, oh, finally. And then you're like, oh, I gotta do this all again tomorrow. Oh my gosh, what? <laughs> this is not going like I thought it was going. Um, are you looking at your life as a series of tasks that you just check off every day, that you just dredge through, you trudge every day, you're just like, oh, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, check, check, check. And your only hope at a happy life is that you win the lottery, right? If I just win the lottery, right? If I win the lottery, all my problems will be gone. Well, the problem is, you don't play the lottery, right? <laughs> it's not gonna help. <laughs> you don't even play the lottery, right? So that's just out the window. 
There are people that live this way. There are people that live this way. And then they wonder why they're depressed, right? And they have no vision of what the future holds for them. They're just, it's a never ending battle. It's a never ending struggle in life. I want to kind of relate this to scripture because we also have Christians that read their Bible this way, that look at their Bible for everything negative, right? They're going in there. And I remember um, Brandon told me this last night, Pastor Wyatt had told a story about when he was in prison, how he was going to read the Bible and just show everybody how wrong it is, right? <laughs> I remember that story. And then he was like, oh no. And it changed him, right? It changed him. They look at every scripture where it says that we fall short, right? They look at every bit of scripture. Uh, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They take this negative attitude into the scriptures with them. And they say, see, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. God hates me, right? So why even bother? The God hates me. The church hates me. I'm, I, I can't win. I can't win. So why even try? Right? They just go through life with this negative vision of their life. And they transfer that negative vision into the scripture and say, see, I knew the church hated me. Right? The church hates everybody. Right? That's why some, and you can see it on social media. They label the church as a hate organization. They do. If you look on social media, they label the church as a hate organization. When you look for hate, when you look for fear, when you look for death, when you look for destruction, you'll find it. When you look for those things, you will find it. When you focus your eyes on those things in scripture, you will find it. You have trained your eye to only focus on the negative. I'm gonna tell you a little story. My mother, bless her heart, she's passed away a few years now, loved to go mushroom hunting. Oh my gosh, she loved to go mushroom hunting. And me and my brother, we loved to go with her most of the time. Um, he would pick us up from school and we would head like directly out of town to go mushroom hunting right after school because she knew that if she didn't get to her mushroom spot, somebody else was going to get there first. So we, she, she would go during the day, then she would come pick us up and then she would go back out to go mushroom hunting with us. And I remember on the weekends, she would pack a lunch for us because we would be gone all day long. We, we would get up eight o'clock in the morning and we were in the woods by nine. <laughs> no, I'm not joking you. We were in the woods by nine. We would mushroom hunt. We would finally, whatever forest we were in, we would go back to the car. We would eat lunch. She would drive us to another section out in the boonies and we would go hunt mushrooms again. We would be gone until it was time for dinner. Like we were gone all day long. And... Bless her heart, my brother and I, we were not the most um, focused on mushroom hunting. We would get our sticks and we'd see how many may apples we could cut down and we'd go through the woods or see what kind of tree we could push over um, or find a turtle or a snake, whatever. We were not focused. And I just remember her, we were walking behind her because that was the rule. You never walked in front of my mom. Mushroom hunting, you did not walk in front of her because you might step on a mushroom that she hadn't found yet, and then you were in trouble. <laughs> you were in trouble. And so I remember walking behind her, and my mom's like, she yelled at my brother and I to stop. Stop walking right now. My first thought was, ooh, she saw a snake. Where is it at? We can't see the snake. She's like, no, I, I saw some mushrooms. Don't move, because I'm sure there's more around here. And my brother and I, we would look, we would look, and we're like, 
we don't see any mushrooms. And she's like, right there. She's like, like that far away from it, pointing at it. And we're like, oh, there it is. She goes, do you see it? And we're like, yeah, we see it. And she goes, and, and look here, there's some more here. And look here, there's more here. The more we focused on what we were looking for, the more we saw to the point where when we started seeing them, we started seeing how many there were. We got into a mushroom patch that was, we had bread bags full. We had bread bags full of mushrooms. We were in this mushroom patch, but my brother and I didn't see it. It wasn't until we focused our eyes that somebody pointed out that mushroom to us that we could start seeing them all around us. We were on our hands and knees. <laughs> crawling through this forest, this woods, so we didn't miss a mushroom. We picked that place clean, let me tell you. Because <laughs> my mom wasn't the letting us out there until we got every single mushroom. It was not. Bless her heart. We have pictures. Uh, I remember her um, about, having, about passing out one day. We were in the, the, the stripper hills, and she was going up the stripper hill, and she started yelling. And we're like, oh, no snake what happened she found a mushroom that like no kidding was was every bit of, of a foot tall and about as big as round as a pop can and there was like three of them growing there and it was like she hit the mother load i mean we've got pictures she went to every single relative we had look at my mushrooms i mean it was a thing it was a whole thing i remember those were some big mushrooms funny thing is i never like to eat them i they're okay. I'm more like just like going out into the woods and having an adventure. That's my, my thing. But the point is, my brother and I weren't looking for those mushrooms until she pointed them out to us. Until we were able to focus on something we were not seeing before, were we able to see it in, in more clarity. It's the same in your life and studying scripture, you must train your eye to see the love of Jesus. You hear that? And, and it's funny because Portia is the one that pointed this out to me a long time ago when I was doing Bible studies. I felt like everything I was being taught was you don't do this, you don't do this, you don't do this, you don't do this, kind of one of those. And so then I would go back and I would study the same lesson with Portia and had a totally different perspective. She's like, do you see how Jesus loves you here? And I'm like, what? No, all I see him is telling me, I know you can't do this. And she's like, no, he's showing you how much he loves you in this part. Look how he loves you. This is what he's given you. And when I used that to study scripture where I was looking for the love of Jesus, it changed. It changed the way I looked at scripture. It did. Um, so you must train your eye to see the love of Jesus. Get out of bed in the morning and get your praise on, right? <laughs> Start praising the Lord right out of bed. Um, thank you, Jesus, for a new day, right? Thank you that I can see your love and your beauty in my life. Thank you for that. Thank you for the beautiful sunrise. But because if I hadn't to get out, if I don't have to get out of bed before, if I have to get out of bed before dark, I have the opportunity to see that sunrise. I can't tell you how many times driving to work in the morning, I get to see the most beautiful sunrise come up every morning. It's amazing. <laughs> and I will tell you right now, more than one time, I have looked up because when you go on 50, there's that, there's like that kind of hill before you get to the, where you go down to the bottoms where all the cornfields are. And if you hit that hill just right, it is just like, oh, like the sunrise is so amazing. It is. It's just like, and I've said it before, I'm like, oh, good job, God. <laughs> God's awesome. Way to go. That was, that's a masterpiece. That's awesome. Um, but I wouldn't be able to see that if I didn't have to get out of bed when it's dark, right? You have to. Um, 
Thank you for my work family, right? Thank you for my work family, where I can earn money to have a good life, where I have the chance to witness to my coworkers and my boss how good you are, how good God is to me. We get the chance to witness to these people when you're out, when you're out in the community. And, and like myself, who, who works in healthcare, where I get the chance to help people. Oh, such a blessing to be able to help people. It truly, truly is. Um, where I can have a positive influence on those around me and show God's goodness in my actions and, and, and words. And as far as traffic goes, you know what? Thank God cars are mostly soundproof. Okay, I'm just going <laughs> to... Thank goodness they're soundproof. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> they can see me, you know, waving my arms. <laughs> they can't hear me say, it's called a blinker. <laughs> but thank goodness they're soundproof, right? For the most part. Um, thank you, Jesus that I have food for my family, that I get to fix, that I get to have a meal, that I get to come home and have a meal with my family. Thank you, Jesus, for my children, that I get to sit down with them, right? And teach them stuff, right? That we can do homework together, that I can teach them things. Children are such a blessing because you get to see the world through their eyes again. You know, about the time you hit your mid-20s and you start having children, the world it seems a little jaded to you. Uh, the, 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 the bright, the spark has kind of gone out of the world anymore. There's like not a lot new under the sun that you haven't experienced. But then you have children and then you see the world again through their eyes, right? Um, where they just like to go out and play in the puddles, right? You know, you get to experience that again. Um, thank you that we have clothes to wear. Thank you. Thankfully, I get to do laundry because I have clothes to wear and I have clean clothes to give my family, right? Um, your home may not always be perfect, and it's not going to be. But God gave it to you to enjoy, right? To share that love with each other. So I encourage all of you in your prayer life to list what you're thankful for. Start focusing on the good in your life and what God has given you. You'll be surprised once you start seeing how blessed you are how much more you'll be thankful for. It's amazing. It really works. And I can't encourage you enough. When you start prayers and you start saying, dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my church. Thank you for my work. Thank you for the opportunity to share your love with my coworker yesterday. Thank you for being able for me to pray at my, with my church family. Thank you for all the blessings that you've given me and my family. Start off with being thankful. I, I just, I can't, I can't push that enough is when you start seeing those mushrooms, right? You start seeing more and more and more of them. You start seeing God's hand in your life. And the more you see his hand in your life, the more you praise him. It's so amazing, so amazing. Um, the same idea also goes for studying scripture, right? When you start seeing the love of Jesus in scripture, the more you see it and the more you find it in every single piece of scripture. It's, it's like God opens your brain up and you start seeing things that have never been there before. I can tell you, I have been given so much 
insight or clarity, I'll put it, studying scripture when you start looking for the love of Jesus. And, and I've had some sermons that I've delivered and I'm like, look, this was not me. This is so over my head. It's not funny. I'm not that smart of a man to figure this stuff out. But guess what? The Lord gave it to me. It's amazing. Once you turn yourself over to Jesus in your study, he will open the Bible up to you so much more than your brain could ever imagine. Um, I remember one sermon that I did, and for some reason, I was, I was online researching a, a section of scripture, and I was like, oh, I wonder what the Greek version of this word means. And that, that totally changed my understanding. I'm like, I've never looked up a Greek word in my life. <laughs> but something told me, hey, look at the Greek word. This is going to change the way you see this scripture. Please start in scripture looking for the love of Jesus, and it will change the way you study. But I also want to caution you that when you start looking for the negative, it's going to have an effect on you also. Um, so I want to look at a, a little section of scripture in Exodus. And this is kind of where a lot of people are like, oh, this is where I'm like, mm, I don't know about God on this one. I don't know. <laughs> Let's look at Exodus and the 10 plagues, okay? So most of us know the story, right? Moses, God tells Moses, hey, I need you to go talk to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Those are my people, and I need you to go talk to him and tell them, let them go. I was telling Mike back there, I'm like, it's amazing. Every time I read a story that I think I know, God just shows me more. So one of the, the things that God told Moses is, hey, here, Aaron, take your staff, throw it on the ground, right? So and it will turn into a serpent. And that will show Pharaoh that I am with you. So Moses did it. He threw the staff down. It turned to a serpent. He kind of like, ah. Oh. And he said, grab it by the tail. And he grabbed it by the tail. It turned back into a staff. So he goes to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, or he throws it down in front of Pharaoh, and it becomes a snake. Pharaoh's uh, little uh, entourage of of um, demons or witchcraft or whatever you want to call them, did the same thing, threw their staffs down and they became snakes. I didn't remember that. But then, guess what happened? The one Moses threw down ate up all the other ones. I know, I didn't remember that part. I was like, ooh, you go. <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't remember that. I didn't remember that part of the story. Um, so the first plague was water becomes blood, right? The second one was frogs. Uh, the third one was lice. Ugh. Tell you right now, my wife would have been done. <laughs> I'll never forget the first day, um, Abby or Brandon came home, or Abby, it was Abby. I'm like, well, you might want to check her hair. One of the other little kids had lice today at, at school. Oh, bless her heart. We went and got the red, at, the red, and we washed her hair and had a little comb, and that was an ordeal. Well, not for me. I didn't have any hair, so I didn't really care. <laughs> but for my wife and Abby, it was a little traumatizing. But. What did Pharaoh do? Pharaoh's like, oh, okay, all right, enough. I, I agree, okay, fine. Take your people and go, but I want you to leave this. And Moses is like, no, this is, th there's no negotiation. This is what we're doing, and this is how we're doing it. So Pharaoh's like, well, then fine. I'm just going to keep them slaves. So then we go to flies. Um, the number five was uh, the livestock all got disease. Number six was boils. Oh, yeah. 
as a young, as a young man, I remember as a teenager having such bad acne. I even got a zit. Look at that. I got one today. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's ridiculous. I'm 52 years old. But I can understand a boil isn't a pimple. It's one of those infected and they hurt and oh, it, it's it's horrible. They're painful, painful. Number seven was hail. Number eight was locust. Number nine was darkness. And this is the one I didn't remember. Moses stretched out his hand to heaven and the darkness came in and covered the land for three days. They couldn't see each other. It was so dark. It even says in the Bible that you could feel the darkness. It was you could touch how the darkness, and I was like, that's just, wow, that, that's crazy. The only place that didn't have darkness was the Israelites that were God's people. Every one of their houses had light. It also goes along with Every one of these plagues did not plague the Israelites because they were God's people. He was showing them, look, I know, I know you think you're, you're, um, you're, you're uh, witches and war, whatever they're called, warlocks or whatever you have. You think they're powerful? No, I'm the true God and I'm going to show you. These are my people, and I'm here to protect them. To the point, he gives Pharaoh the ultimate ultimative. Let my people go, or every firstborn is going to be taken from you. Livestock, animals, and people. Your firstborn will be, I will take them. And here is where some people are like, wow, really? God kills babies? You have to look for the love. Where has he shown them love? So let's go back to our scripture reading, Exodus 3, 6 through 10. And the Lord said in verse 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry. Because of their taskmasters, I know their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Parents, if your child cries out to you, because of their in pain or something's wrong, do you ignore them? No, no, you don't. You take care of them. <laughs> exactly. Right, mommy takes care of you, doesn't she? Right? Yes. You don't ignore the cries of your children. You also have to remember what kind of environment his people were in. They were slaves, right? They were being beat. They were being whipped. They were being killed, right? Doesn't matter. Their lives meant nothing to these Egyptians. Let's go to verse Exodus 12 verse 12 and here's where you gotta you gotta you gotta dig you gotta dig sometimes to see the love of jesus sometimes for i will pass through the land of egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of egypt both man and beast and against all the gods of egypt i will execute judgment 
I am the Lord. So who is he executing judgment against? Is it the people? The gods of Egypt. Who, do you remember from, from school, the, the Egyptian gods, Ra and the crocodile guy and, you know, all those gods. Are they real gods? No, no. It says right there, I am the Lord. So again, who were God's people sub subjugated to? Satan. They were slaves in a satanic environment. So let me ask you again. If your child was kidnapped and held captive by a bunch of satanic people, making them work their entire lives to serve you, what would you do to get them out of that environment? There's the love of God for you right there. There's his love. Where's his mercy? How many plagues did he put on these people to open their eyes to show them who the true God was? Did they listen? No. I can tell you right now, like I said, my wife would have been lice. I'm out of here. See ya. <laughs> We'd have been gone. We'd have been way gone. Um, but again, 10 plagues these people went through. How hardened was their heart against the true God? Their hearts were so hardened. They didn't care. The Egyptian people didn't care because you know what? Satan had told them, I will take care of you. But God said, no, I'm the true God. I'm going to show you who has the power here and that these are my people and I love them and I'm going to take care of them. So I'm going to show you who's in charge here. I'm going to show you how much I love them. God showed his people love by sparing them from his wrath that the Satan worshipers suffered. And we know that God was executing judgment against the gods of Egypt. And again, that one verse, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twenty six chapters later, right? Nine chapters later. Right? Nine chapters later shows you the love of God. Right? Sometimes don't, don't go into it with your vision clouded by hate, by destruction. Right? Look through it. How do I see Jesus loving me in this scripture? Sometimes it's hard. And I've come to class before where I've ta taught Sabbath school and said, hey, guys, help me. I don't see it. Help me see the love of Jesus in this scripture because I'm not getting it. And I pray, pray, Lord, please open my eyes so that I can see your love in this. Show me what you want me to see. So in closing, no matter what, set your eyes on the love of Jesus and his good works. Search him out in life, search him out in scripture, and search him out in nature. And when Jesus comes again, you will know him and his glory. Amen. All right. Oh, and Laurel just went to change the baby, didn't she? <laughs> That's okay. Um, our closing hymn is what? What is it? 647. 